I swear this was perfect when I put it in the box. I take it out of the box, and it's ten thousands out. Hello Internet, my name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. I'm back on the Pennsylvania A3 Switcher locomotive build today. Previously we rolled and stitched the boiler shell, and now we need to add all of the features to that shell to prepare it for all the accessories that will eventually be attached to it. So let's go. Here's where we left off. I had just finished this riveted seam in there in the shell, and the shell's been squared up and face to length and so on. And now we need a whole bunch of fancy holes in it. A locomotive boiler doubles as part of the frame. A lot of the accessories and things are mounted to it. So we need a bunch of holes for bushings and studs and other things to mount all those things. For this job, I've got an excessively fancy setup here that I'm gonna do. I made this plate here to mount my lathe chucks to my rotary table. I have a video on doing this if you're interested. And what I'm gonna do is set up a rotary setup on my mill to do all of these holes. It's gonna create sort of a half of a polar coordinate system here. Now, to be clear, you could absolutely do this job just by laying out the holes on a surface plate and maybe holding the ends of the boiler with some blocks of wood or some angle plates and drilling them all out on the drill press, something like that. You absolutely don't have to be as fancy as I'm about to be here, but you know, I have the toys and I like to use them. With the rotary table set on edge like this, I have keys there that I've made for both horizontal and vertical orientations on this rotary table. So it's slotted into the key slots. And then I have a footstock for my mill which also has keys on it. This rotary table has a Morse taper 2 in it, same as my lathe tail sock, which is very handy. It means I can use the dead center from my lathe in the rotary table to align things on center. Next, I've got this alignment bar here that I've turned previously, and this is an extremely, extremely accurate bar. It's actually the most accurate thing I've ever made. It's about 24 inches in length, and it's within a couple of tenths of being the same diameter all the way down the length. And that's very, very important for what I'm about to do here. With that bar held between centers there, between the rotary table and the footstock, I can now put an indicator on this and get everything aligned here. I'm essentially building a lathe on the mill table here, so there's a lot of alignment to check and adjustments to make. Many of those adjustments I've made previously and are sort of saved in this setup between uses, but I have to check everything to make sure. Now in the case of the y-axis alignment here, I've actually made the keys for my footstock a little bit narrower than the T-slots on the mill. The reason for this is that that rotary table didn't actually have a key slot for the vertical orientation. I had to mill it myself, and there weren't any good references for getting it perfectly centered on the underside. It's all rough castings in between the machine surfaces, so I did my best to align that key with the center of the rotary table, but it isn't perfect. It's out by about ten thousandths, as you can see here. So my solution to this was to make the keys smaller on the footstock to give myself some adjustment there, so I can tap the whole system back into alignment. And someday I might take another swing at making the key slot on the underside of the rotary table perfect. That's a big difficult job though, and I don't use this setup enough to justify it, and making the footstock adjustable laterally was easy. But as you can see here, I'm able to tap that into within a thousandth over about 18 to 20 inches here, so that's excellent. Far more accuracy than we need for what we're about to do here. You can see now though the importance of the diameter being accurate on this bar, because if the bar had taper in it or there was a narrow spot in the middle or something, then dialing it in like this would not be aligning the footstock to the rotary table, it would just be compensating for taper in the bar, and we'd end up with one of the two ends crooked. I also check the vertical, but typically there's no adjustment needed here because the height of the rotary table is of course fixed, and the height of the footstock is adjustable from the factory with those slotted bolts there. So. I made this adjustment once when I first got the footstock, and I've never needed to touch it since. It's nice when things are factory adjustable. Now I can bring in the boiler shell. I've got one wood former in the end there, so the chuck doesn't crush it. In the other end, I've got the other wood former, but you notice it's sticking out, and that's because I've intentionally misaligned the key slot there with the rivet strip. That's so that the wood former won't slide into the shell, and it gives the footstock quill something to press against to hold everything securely. Otherwise, when I try to tighten the quill, it's just going to push the former into the shell. If you don't have a footstock for your mill, you could also do this with a slotted angle plate, for example, and just run a bolt through it and into that wooden former in the back. And honestly, you could do that on the other end too. That would be accurate enough for a job like this. With everything snugged up there, now my job is to get the center line of this cylinder on the center line of the mill on the y-axis. 
This is too big for edge finding. You could do it with a DTI on one of those spindle mounted arms, but for the level of accuracy that I need here, I'm going to use an old school trick, which is to put something pointy in the spindle and use it to pin a scale to the top of the surface. You can do this trick with any round surface. Then you just simply move the cylinder back and forth until the scale is level by eye. And if you're careful about this, this is actually surprisingly accurate. You can get to within a few thousandths of perfectly on center doing this. And in this case, it's a good choice because a DTI would just be frustrating because this isn't, of course, a perfect cylinder. It's been rolled and hammered and heated and beaded. It's cylinder-like, but at DTI precision levels, it's going to drive you crazy trying to center it that way. The next job is to get the center line in the right place. Do you remember when we scribed these three lines on the shell before rolling it? Well, this line here is the top center line, the one opposite the seam on the boiler. And it's not enough to have the cylinder on center. That line has to be on center so that we can position all the holes in the correct places relative to the seam on the boiler. So for that, I'm bringing in my wiggler pointer thing. And I'm going to get this lined up on that scribe line, which is still visible to me. You can't really see it on camera. And what I'm doing is I'm rotating the shell in the jaws on the rotary table. The rotary table is locked at zero, and I'm just rotating the shell in the jaws. This is because you can't zero the hand wheels, if you like, on a rotary table the way that you can on a mill or a lathe. So you can't zero the fixture to the work. Thus, you have to zero the work to the fixture. So with the rotary table locked at zero, I turn the shell until my scribe line is right under that pointer with the rotary table on zero. And now we're on center, and our rotation is set on zero. Next, I bring in the edge finder and find one edge of the boiler there. I can just sneak in between the jaws there on the fore jaw to do this. That edge is the front of the boiler. I've calculated all the dimensions on the drawing to be referenced from that edge. The y-axis on the mill remains locked throughout this. So now I have a coordinate system on x and a rotational system. So it's kind of half of a polar coordinate system. I've got an x position and an angle for every hole. I'm going to start with the easiest ones, which are the handrail holes. The boiler has little handrails that run down the length of it. And there are four holes which these handrails attach to. Two on each side, and they're 45 degrees off of the top center line of the boiler. So I've rotated the rotary table around to 45 degrees one way. And I center drill that. And then I go in with a tapping drill size for quarter 40. And this is an interesting thing that Kozo does here. He has you thread most of these holes. More on that in a second, but after drilling and center drilling that, then I go around to negative 45 degrees off of center and do the same thing. And that gives me the first two handrail holes. And then again, with my half polar coordinate system here, I stay on the same angle and translate down to where the third hole goes and do that again. And then once again, rotate to positive 45 degrees off of center for the remaining hole. From this angle, you can get a better sense of how this setup works. It's a lot of fun, this setup. Once again, you certainly don't need to do it this way, but I like doing stuff like this on the mill. It's a lot of fun. Now comes the threading. These handrail holes get threaded quarter 40. And this is a pretty unusual thing to do. You would never thread a boiler shell for structural reasons like this, because of course, copper doesn't hold threads very well. And a boiler shell is not very thick. Even with a 40 TPI thread, you're only getting three threads in this 80 thou thick plate. And that's if the plate was flat. On a curved surface like this, you're lucky if you're getting two full threads in there. So why does he do this? This is not structural. This is just for silver solder fixturing. By threading these holes, the bronze studs that we're going to make will hold themselves in position while you silver solder them which is really valuable on a boiler shell because everything's at a weird angle and it would be very difficult to hold everything square to the surface and in position while you silver solder them. It's very clever and not something I would have thought to do. The next couple of holes are 90 degrees either side off center and they're pretty interesting. These are the water inlet holes. Water in a boiler is consumable, of course, and you need a way to get the water in while the locomotive is underway. These inlets are positioned so that they're below the water line, so that the water going in can get heated up as quickly as possible and won't lower the pressure of the boiler too much, which can happen when you pump cold water in there, and so it doesn't disrupt the valuable steam sitting above the water line. These holes are close to the end, so you can see me getting into the wood former there a little bit, but that's okay. I'm going extra deep to make sure I've got clearance for the tap. Now, why are there two of them? The reason that boilers have multiple ways to get water into them is because water level is the single most important safety thing in a boiler. You might think that what causes boilers to explode is some sort of overpressure situation. It's not generally the case. I mean, that can happen, but what really tends to cause them to explode is the water level getting too low 
and the crown sheet above the fire becoming uncovered. Because amazingly, the coal fire burns hotter than the melting point of the steel or copper that the boiler is made from. The only thing that keeps the coal fire from melting the boiler is the water around the firebox. And that condition is so important, so crucial to safety that you have to have redundant ways to get water into a boiler. At least two and often three or more methods are always involved. So in this locomotive, we've got a hand pump in the tender and an axle pump on the engine. And bigger locomotives will also often have steam injectors as a third way. Steam injectors, by the way, are worth looking up if you're interested in this sort of thing. They are really amazing. You wouldn't think it is possible to push water into a pressure boiler using steam at that same pressure and somehow pushing the water in above that pressure, but it is possible. They are amazing. However, most people on three and a half inch gauge locomotives don't use them because the physics of them don't scale very well. And at this tiny size, they really don't work very well. These holes also get tapped for silver solder fixturing, but these are 5 16 24. And at 24 TPI in an 80 thou thick curved plate, this is extremely dubious. We're lucky if we're getting one full thread in there, but you know, it's just for fixturing, so it should be okay, I guess. Next is a hole top center at the front, which is the most adorable hole on the boiler. It's for the bell stud, which is so named because it's where the bell mounts. Every locomotive needs a whistle and a bell, and someday there will be a bell mounted here. It's gonna be adorable. On to the big holes now. There's one fairly large one near the front here. This is for the water fill bushing. Kozo's design includes a dedicated place to fill the boiler. A lot of boiler designs forego this. People either just remove one of the safety valves and fill through that, or people will also just use the hand pump to fill the boiler that way. But those methods are a little less convenient, so it's nice to have a dedicated bushing here for the purpose. This hole is only a little bit larger than my largest stubby drill, so I open it up the rest of the way with the boring head. I will say that measuring the size of a hole on a convex surface like this is a little tricky with a bore gauge. What I'm doing is only measuring along the long axis of the shell there, so that I'm measuring two positions on those surfaces that are at the same height and hopefully eliminating any cosine error there. Next up is the star of the show. It's the steam dome hole. This is where the steam dome base goes. It's a very large hole and I'm starting by center drilling it, but not for the reason that you might expect. I'm actually going to do some layout on this hole. So I center drilled the center of it there so that I can come in with a divider and scribe the outline of this hole. My scribe line here is quite pessimistic. It's quite a bit smaller than the final hole will be, and you'll see why here in a moment. In order to save myself a lot of work with drilling and boring, I'm going to be chain drilling out this hole first. And actually, I'm using an end mill because being a convex surface, a drill would wander all over the place. So I guess you could say I'm chain milling this. This is a two flute center cutting end mill, so it can plunge through the material at any point with no difficulty, and it won't deflect the way a drill would. There are as many ways to do this as there are strong-minded machinists. You could certainly chain drill this if you center drilled each position first. You could drill a single hole to start and fret saw out the hole and then file it or bore it to finished dimension. You could start with a hole saw and then bore it. You could use a step bit and then bore it after that. You could use an annular cutter. You could use big silver and Deming drills to rough it in. You could mount this thing on your rotary table and mill it in a circle. You could mount this thing on your faceplate and bore it out with a boring bar on the lathe. Lots and lots of ways to do this sort of thing. I'm using an end mill here and just following my circle around here to save myself the time of all of the boring head work. And I chose this method because it was easy given the setup that I have here and the amount of vertical space that I have and my strong desire to not risk overshooting the size of this hole because I have many, many hours invested into this boiler shell at this point. We're nearing the very end of this part here, and now is not the time to take chances with new processes or new ways of doing things that I might not have experience with. This is something I've done a lot of, and I know it's going to work, and it was quick. As I'm going around here, you'll see me occasionally adjusting the position of the table in or out a little bit because as you go down on a convex surface, it can be a little bit tricky to guess where the full diameter of the end mill is gonna land. And I'm trying to make sure that none of my end mills land outside the scribe line there. But just in case, as I said, the scribe line was also a little bit pessimistic, so I have some margin for error there. And then I'll finish out with the boring head to bring it to final dimension. And this went very quickly, as you can see in this regular speed footage here. You could also conceivably use the bolt circle function on your DRO for this, but honestly, it was just easier to go around and overlap the holes as you see here. With that roughed out, then I came in with the boring head to finish it up. This went very quickly here. I only needed a few passes with this guy. I started by touching off on kind of the peaks there of all those holes 
And the first couple of passes are just cleaning up the debris left by the milling there. Then I got into the full cuts and I was just about done. Now I'm being fussy about the dimensions of these holes just because I always try to hit what the drawing says, but the truth is if you blow a dimension on one of these, it's really not a big deal because we haven't made any of the bushings yet that go in all of these holes, so you can always adjust and make the mating part to fit as needed. But with a little deburring there, I can take my final measurement. Once again, measuring a bore diameter on a convex surface is a pretty tricky thing, especially when the material is thin like this. I took these measurements multiple, multiple times to make sure that I was really getting the accurate dimension that I think I am. And that is looking really, really good there. I'm happy with that. That should be the last of the holes, so I can take this down from this setup here. This was a lot of fun to do it this way, and I already had all the gear from previous boilers that I've made. I built that crazy setup initially for my 4-inch vertical stationary boiler that I built last year. There is, of course, a playlist in my playlists for that boiler if you want to see more about this setup and the development of it and how it was used in the vertical shelf for that project. Now I can take it all down, and I've got a heck of a deburring job to do. It's not safe for Hulk punching in there with all the chips, so I'll use standard Imperial square bar punch instead. The good news now is that should be the last time we need to use any of those wood formers on this boiler. Unless, of course, I have to make the boiler again, so I'm not going to jinx it by throwing them away. But what this means is I can do the ritual cleansing of the machine tools by re-anointing them with whey oil to remove the cooties of the dead trees that were in contact with them for an extended period. Much better. Here's a mock-up showing where things are at. You can see how the boiler shell fits in there. It sits on the throat plate in front of the firebox tube sheet there. And then on the other end, we've got the front tube sheet in position there. And of course, standard Swarfy the Duck for scale. It's really starting to look like a boat. I mean, boiler now, and I'm getting pretty excited. We've got a lot of bronze bushings and things to make to go in this shell, so that will be coming up soon. But there's something satisfying about the basic success of a bunch of very nicely made holes in a cylinder. I hope this was enjoyable to watch, and thank you very much for watching, and thanks especially to my patrons who make all of this content possible, and I will see you next time.